Good afternoon from Ottawa and uh, welcome to African Scholars Initiative graduate study webinar focused on funding. Uh, my name is Professor Gideon Christian. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Calgary Faculty of Law, as well as the president of uh, ASI Canada. So may I use this opportunity to welcome all the participants from different parts of the world. Um, in this webinar today, we are going to be talking about um, graduate funding. And this is part of our ongoing webinar of, African, of the African Scholars Initiative. By way of introduction, African Scholars Initiative, it's a Canadian registered not-for-profit organization that seeks to attract scholars, bright scholars of African descent to pursue graduate education in Canada. And one way we do this, uh, or primary, one of the primary way we do this is by organizing webinars uh, such as this one to disseminate um, relevant information that um, will be useful to um, uh, graduate students or prospective graduate students who wish to pursue graduate education in Canada. So for this particular session, we will be talking about um, graduate funding. And I have with me today uh, a panel of um, international students who have been very successful in not just the admission process in Canada, but also securing funding. So the essence of this webinar is to kind of have an informal interaction with these um, international students, uh, share their experience, I mean, get their experiences or also share experiences, and then also try to get from them uh, tips or, uh, uh, that will help applicants in uh, being, I mean, in applying for and obtaining graduate funding from. Uh, for education or graduate education in Canada. So without wasting much time, I would like to um, um, briefly introduce uh, the two panel members. So I have two panel members joining me today, and that is in the person of uh, Kunle Aina as well, Ade Kunle Aina and uh, Chinonye Ode Chuku. So I will turn the table over to them now and allow them to kind of introduce themselves uh, more in detail. So why don't we start with you, uh, Kunle? Uh, okay, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Uh, we are happy to see you, and I'm happy to be, to be here and share uh, my experience with you. So like he said, I am Aina Adekunle, and uh, I'm studying here in Canada. And um, so I'm originally from Nigeria, uh, and then I've gone through the process of coming here to study and getting funding and all of that, and I hope to share everything with you. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what I have for now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your scholar, I mean, like the current fundings you've held in the past and what you're holding right now in the, in the course of your graduate um, studies? Okay. Just give us so, a brief, just, you don't have to, we'll go into detailed discussion, but just a brief outline of. Okay, okay. So I, I, I did my undergraduate studies uh, at the University uh, of Lagos in Nigeria. And then I, I came here uh, to Canada about five years ago to start my master's program uh, at uh, Memorial University. And then I'm currently at University of British Columbia studying for my PhD. Uh, my field is in physics. Uh, more specifically, I do things that relate to biology. So that's, uh, and then I've held, so for my, for my, uh, I've heard about three to four fundings for my graduate studies. And when we talk more about the details, I'm going to share with you what these uh, fundings are and, and others that you, you probably can, I mean, take opportunity of. Okay, thank you very much, um, Kunle. Uh, okay, you're muted, let's see. 
Okay. Yep. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone, wherever you are tuning in into this webinar. My name is Chinonye Udechuku, and I am currently a PhD student at the University of Ottawa, Canada. So just a little bit of my academic background. I did my bachelor's education in pure and industrial chemistry at the University of Nigeria. And that was between 2008 and 2012. And afterwards, I went for my youth service in Nigeria for one year. And then I came to Canada in 2015 for my master's in food biochemistry or food bioscience. And that was in 2015. So I completed my master's in 2017. And then I worked for, for two years before starting my PhD in 2019. And like I said, I do that in neuroscience and I look at how we can use our diet or our nutrition to um, prevent or treat mental illnesses. Um, in terms of the awards that I've held, well, from my master's I had, um, so I was funded through my supervisor's funding, um, my, my supervisor's research grant and then also when I got to the university, so I actually had my master's at Dalhousie University. And when I got there, I was given admission scholarship of 6,000 per year. And then I got some other internal scholarships, you know, that I would also talk about um, within the school. And then um, moving on to my PhD, I got a nutrition and mental health scholarship it's an internal, internal scholarship offered within my department, or maybe not my department, by, but within the faculty. And then I, after that, I had um, the Vani scholarship, so which is um, the most prestigious one in Canada, and especially for PhD students. And um, the good news also is that the scholarship is available to international students. So that, and then also I got um, CIHR. So this is um, Canadian Institute of Health Research Scholarship. It's also a federal scholarship like the Vanny Scholarship, but I, I declined that one. So I got that one um, the same time with the Vanny Scholarship, but I had to decline the CIHR because, you can, because both are major scholarships and you can hold them at the same time. So the Vanny was, um, or is 50,000 per year but the CIHR is 35,000. So it's a no brainer for me to turn down CIHR. <laughs> so yes, um, those are the scholarships that I have um, at the moment. And um, yeah, so I'm very happy to, you know, uh, my journey so far to Canada has been and like, it's, it's been a joyful one. It's been a rewarding one as well. And I've always made it a point of, you know, purpose to share my experiences with people who are aspiring to come to Canada for grad studies and also people who are here already because you know we are one big family and we are always trying to find information to propel us further in our um, career. So I am very much happy to share these experiences and um, insights with you. Thank you once again. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Chinenyi. So, um, I mean, from the introduction you've had so far, uh, there's no doubt about it that the two um, panelists we have here are, I mean, competently suited to talk about um, uh, 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 graduate funding in Canada. So um, we are going to be, you know, going into details of their experience and then you see how you can benefit from their experience and what um, tips you can get. But before we go into that experience, can I now turn over to you two again? This time around, I want you to maybe probably share with the participants. Your journey to Canada, how did it start? So I'm talking basically from, you know, your institution where you finished your undergrad studies. From the time you started thinking about coming to Canada to study, can you kind of take us through that experience? What did you do? And uh, what do you think was very instrumental in your being able to eventually end up in Canada? So uh, Kunle, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I will have to unmute you, so okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I think I should start from, so I went to the University of Vegas. Um, 
between 2009 and uh, 2013. And then when I finished, so I'm from Nigeria. In Nigeria, there's a kind of mandatory service before you get to work in Nigeria. So I went for the one year service and I, after the one year service, uh, I, got, I got a teaching job and then I, I started. So I went back to do my master's at U University of Lagos where I finished, but uh, uh, I, was not, uh, I was not satisfied with uh, what I was getting. So I decided to, there was something unique that happened actually. So my first class during my master's, the, the professor just asked a question from about 20 of us that were in the class. And then he said, uh, I mean, we didn't know the question. And the, the next thing he said was that we did not know anything. And then he basically, he basically trashed us like that we are empty eggs and all of that. So I was very, um, I was very down that day. Because I mean that was I didn't expect that thing. And the next thing, I've never heard about anything before. I just went back to my office because I was also working there. I went back to my office and I googled how can I study abroad for free because I had no money, like I had zero. So and then there was um, I I got I got a lot of information. So what? So the information that I got now that took many, many, many months, I can just distill it for you now. Like, so what now happened is I, dis I found out that Canada is one of the best places that you can go to study uh, for many reasons, even after your, after your studies. So, but for studying, uh, especially for graduate studies, uh, you, they, there's a kind of, they provide funding for those that want to do research. And that's what I want to talk about now. So when you come to Canada here, when you come to Canada here, there are, there are different routes that you can take. Uh, funding, um, you can do research or you can go do cost-based program. So I chose to do research because they said that for many schools that I checked, they said they can provide you funding if you do research. So what I did was now I began to search for schools, the best schools in Canada, the schools that offer funding in Canada. Then I got a lot of them. And then I started searching for each de department that I want to work in. So I wanted to work in physics department. So I went to the physics department, the physics department in each of the universities. And then I looked at the professor's profile so for example, back home, where the university I finished from, if you go to our website, our website, there's no much information. Like you don't even know what the professors are doing. But one thing you should know in Canada is the website, the university website very, there's a lot of information. Each professor has his own web, web, web page or web pages. And there's a lot of information. You can see what they are doing. So you go there, you look at what each of the professors are doing in the department and then uh, so what I did was to identify like three or four people that I know that, oh, this thing that they are doing is very interesting and I want to do it. So the next thing is after looking at them, then I started, I started sending emails to each of them. And the email is very simple because looking back now and knowing more about the information, uh, if you send long emails, they might not, they might be intimidated to read it because one thing is that they receive a lot of emails. So, and wherever you are, it's not people from your own place that are, that are, are trying to email them. So everybody in the world, they are trying to email them. So you have to make your email unique. Like uh, my emails are usually, oh, I've read something about you, which they always want to hear about. I've read, oh, I read some, this thing about you. Oh, I read one of your papers. Oh, I read, ah, this thing is very interesting that you introduced in this field. Uh, and then you tell them that, oh, and I've also done something related, or I'm interested in doing something related. Would you be able to, I mean, supervise me if I apply for this program? And then, oh, these are my credentials attached. 
just very brief and something that's interesting. I can, uh, if you can, um, I mean, I can send you like um, examples of the kind of emails I sent then. Uh, maybe after the webinar, I can, um, maybe there's a way you can coordinate with prof that I will send him the email and then he can forward it to you. So, um, and then afterwards, so one thing you should note is that the professors, some of them, you can get mixed reactions. Some of them will not respond at all. Some of them will respond and tell you, I have no funding, I can't supervise you. Most of them will not tell you that, oh, okay, come, I can supervise you, there's money. Most of, almost none of them will tell you that. Uh, so, uh, so, but what I always advise is that no matter the reaction you get, the next thing for you is to get, gather your, your documents, different documents that you need to, different documents that you need to apply. So you need to apply for the program. The only way the professors can actually assess whether they want to admit you or not is, is actually applying. Because when you apply, the department will circulate your application to the professors in the department uh, to look at to look out for potential uh, students. So the advantage of you emailing them previously is that if your application is interesting, they might want to go back and say, oh, I saw, I saw this name previously, uh, like in my email. They might search for their email and see your email and, oh, this person has contacted me before. And they can readily get back to you. Oh, I saw your application and blah, blah, blah. So, the act of sending that email is very important. So, uh, so most times, the next thing that will happen is that you can find a professor that will message you and say, oh, let's chat. So it's going to give you like an interview or he might not give you an interview. You will just, you will just see that the department issue you your admission somehow. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, but that's essentially what it entails. You need to, you need to uh, you need to read about professors in your area, like briefly about what they are doing. You go to the department website, what they are doing, and then you need to email them, like showing your interest in what they are showing interest in what they are doing. And then, secondly, which is the most important, the top, top thing, which is most important, you need to apply. Like you need to apply. You cannot, you cannot, if you send email like forever you will not get anything. The only way you can get something is you need to put in your application. So I think, um, yeah, that's what I would say for now, just for the interest of time. Okay. So, um, Kunle, during this process of, you know, emailing the professors, how many professors did you email? Can you think of how many emailed, how many got back to you? And um, yeah, so, you so uh, let me just say something to you. The, the process of leaving your country to come to another country like Canada to study is not something that is easy. So it's only easy when you see someone like me or someone like Chino like, you know, here talking about, oh, we are studying for free and all of that. A lot of things has, I mean, a lot of things have happened in the past. Like you need to put in a lot of work. So if you want to send email, so for example, I, when I was searching, I searched through the top universities in Canada, like seven of them. And I searched for middle rated universities in Canada, like three of them. So those are 10 universities. And in these 10 universities, I emailed more than, 10, more than 70 professors. More than 70 professors. So, and yeah, that's, uh, that's what it takes when you really need it badly. So uh, you have to send the email and I can give you the clue. It's not, it's not as if the email is, there are not 70 unique emails, uh, so to speak. It's a, you need to see that, get like the main structure of your email, one of them. And then what you just be doing is you'll be tailoring, you'll be tailoring the email to the specific, to the, spe to the, specific, uh, to the specific professor. So like where the name is, you change the name. Where their subject matter is, you change subject matter. So 
you tailor it. So it's a it's something that is really intensive, and you have to really, I mean, push like really hard. So uh, yeah, and then so the reason you have to do it this way is that you are not the only one applying. Many people around the world are applying, and the more opportunity you put out there, the more probability that you can get something out. So lots of universities, lots of departments, lots of professors, and you just hope that one, you just need one. So it's just one that you need and hopefully you get it. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, Kunle, thank, thank you so, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Kunle, for those, um, for, you know, yeah, sharing your story with us. We'll still come back and um, discuss your experience in details. Uh, before I turn over to Chinonye, uh, let me quickly say this to the participants. So please, in the course of this um, discussion, uh, if you have questions, can you please put your question in the chat, board, chat box? So Marion is going to be looking after the chat box. Uh, sorry, chat box, not chat box. She's going to be looking after the chat box. So uh, at the end of the conversation, uh, we'll now go to the second aspect of this webinar, which would now be uh, addressing the questions that are asked by the um, um, by by the participants. So please, if you have any question, uh, just put them in the chat box. Now uh, we now go over to our second. Um, panelists, Chinonye. Let's hear about your experience. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to speak. So my experience to Canada or my journey to Canada is um, what I call um, it's, it's an unconventional one. It's not really the traditional route that every other person would take. Um, for instance, I'm Conley. So mine, um, <laughs> this is story time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so like I said, I had my bachelor's education in um, chemistry at the University of Nigeria in Soka um, between 2008 and 2012. So when I was done with my bachelor's, um, when I was there, I, I would like to think that I was, I was a good student, probably not at the very top of my class, probably the first um, five, fifth, okay, but not like the very, very, at the very top, okay? So, but I was quite a good student and I've always, you know, um, um, you know strove to be in, in my academic process. So when I graduated, I did my, my youth service between 2013 and 2014. And when I was done with my service in 2014, on my birthday, September 10, I, I got a message. I remember I was sitting beside my, my mom's bed, you know. <laughs> My mom was sort of, um, I think she was planning, you know, to do just a little bit of, you know, um, a little party, cake, chin chin, you know how those things happen. So, and then I got this message and it, it read, you've been recommended for graduate studies for masters on full funding, <clears throat> excuse me, at Dalhousie University, Canada. Okay, so I was like, yeah, I scoffed. I'm like, yeah, this is a scam. Wow. I, for one, did not apply for any um, scholarship. And I was not even applying for grad studies, okay? I never related to anyone that I wanted grad studies or, you know, to pursue my, my you know, graduate um, degree. So when I did my when I finished my bachelor's, I mean, I would have loved to continue on to a master's, but then um, because of my family's then financial background or situation, we I, like I didn't feel like that would be the wise thing to do, and especially being the first child of sex. So everything that I had on my mind was to pursue, you know, money. 
find ways to help my family, my parents relieve the financial burden that you know, we were experiencing at the time. So that was all my purpose. My mom really wanted me, my mom is a teacher, a very proud and successful one. So she really wanted me to continue um, to a master's program, but I'm like, I can't I can do that. I don't want to eat into your pocket anymore. So when that message came, you can imagine my, my you know, the, 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 the puzzling look that I had on my face. Like, where is this coming from? I did not apply for grad studies. I never told anyone I was looking for grad studies. I, I did not apply for any scholarship. So this has to be a scam. Like, I showed my dad, my mom, they were like, yeah, that has to be a scam. But then on a second look, that message came from a reputable professor in my then department at the University of Nigeria in Soka. And I'm like, hold on. Okay, there is probably something, some sort of line that, that I'm missing here. But, you know, the person said in his message that I should come to the university the following week on a Wednesday. So I'm like, okay, if my dad was like, ah, this has to be, you know, child trafficking, kidnapping. These are all plots to kidnap my daughter and, and everything. <laughs> So, but like I said, the message came from a reputable professor. And then I, I, you know, I replied and yeah, he said that I should come. But I mean, still like, you know, if someone was planning to scam me or kidnap me, yeah, of course they already hacked into the person's phone or anything like, you know, to um, communicate with me. But still, I felt like I, I wanted to pursue that and see, you know, um, to the very end of it. So I followed up, went to the university the following week and then that was how the story, you know, began to unravel. And I was told, you know, there were some sort of meetings and deliberations because someone, a professor here in Canada at the Hansi University wanted a student and like he had a funding and then he sort of wanted the student to come from Nigeria, sort of, you know, uplifting um, Nigerians as well. So like, you know, smart students. So he he wanted someone and then he told somebody else that he knew at the time. And then the person was the person who was the one who contacted me. So the person is a, is a professor in my department at the time. So he then, you know, went to the department, you know, they talked and then they sort of like, you know, came to the conclusion, okay, let's um, give this opportunity to Chinonye. And to be honest, I still don't even understand why that, like I was sort of the chosen one, because like I said, I wasn't at the very top of my class. If you're ranking, I'll probably be the fourth or the fifth, okay? So, but um, it's something that I also, in fact, for the most part, attribute to God's favor and grace. So, that was exactly how, you know, my journey to, to Canada began. And then I was told I was going to um, have a phone interview, Skype interview with the professor here in Canada. So which I did like in a few weeks later, and then, you know, interviewed me. He wanted to know my plans and everything I told him. But then still, he saw the hunger. He saw that I like if she like if I had the opportunity, you know, in, in terms of finances, I would have pursued grad studies because really I knew what I wanted to do. But just that at the time I was, you know, limited by finances. Right. So he was very much willing to take me like he was super impressed. And then he's like, yeah, sure, let's do it. So being that he had funding that was how i did he then asked me to apply for admission right which is something that we'll talk about you know later on in the webinar because you know for you to get an admission there must have been some sort of funding depending on the program you're getting into so um with the funding i applied for admission and then i was offered admission like this was happening around october november 2014 and then I, I applied for the next year's May admission and I was offered admission in January 2015. And then I came to Canada in May for my grad studies. So um, like I said, it's, it's not the traditional way, you know, just like highlighted um, or like many people um, do 
you contact the supervisor, you know, you go hunting, right? Finding the, the person to work with and the person who has funding. So mine was more like a recommendation. So sometimes when I talk to people, like some people feel like, okay, maybe they can't, I can't really relate to the struggle of finding a supervisor, but that I would say for sure, because even for my PhD, I didn't have to struggle. And I didn't have to struggle because when I came into the system, I understood what I needed. And so I was very strategic in my search and like was more like I landed a supervisor right away, almost right away. So, but then um, there is an underlying lesson here to be learned and which is that, you know, you know, whatever you're doing, I tell people this, someone might be watching, right? I, when I was in, when I was in UNN, like I wasn't like a popular student. In fact, I was one of those students, hidden students. You would not even know. It's only my grades that people would see and be like, oh, who is this person? Like, I wasn't really involved in, you know, and much, you know, even the positions that I held in the university were like, more like um, appointments. Oh, okay, we want you to be the vice president of this. We want you to be this. I was never the one seeking for all the, like I was very quiet. That person that goes to church, come back, school, um, um, night class, you know, all of those stuff. Yeah, that was me when I was in UNN. But it was more like, um, you know, the things that you do, if you're good, your goodness would speak for you, okay? It's, it's not, it's not going to be covered. Like, people would see that and people would acknowledge. And then if there is an opportunity, you know, someone may be willing to give you that opportunity. So also see it as a way of preparing yourself, whatever you're doing, do it very well, right? So that when the opportunity comes up, then you're in a very good position to, you know, get aboard. So that's something to um, learn from this as well. And then I was just knowing that someone can recommend you. It's amazing. Like it's something really amazing if you ask me, because I mean, right now there are some people that are, you know, um, I've sort of had their, yeah, like I've had some relationship with them academically and then I know that they are good and I've recommended for grad studies, right? So just be good. Uh, thank you very much, Chinna Nyeso and uh, Kunle for sharing your experience. So um, from what you've, I mean, from what you've seen so far, um, there are many routes to this journey. You can be so fortunate like Chinna Nye, and you just be celebrating your birthday somewhere and get a text message that you recommended to study in Canada. But that one is like, you know, it's like a thunder strike. It happens in the same spot, really twice. But I mean, it do happen. I mean, it does happen, right? Then it could also be maybe in the case of Kunle, you know, going online, do the search, send 70 or more emails and probably get majority zero response. And then suddenly there is this one response that comes that's not just positive, but super positive. That's also another way. There are also, there are also some other way, but I'll keep that for now. Um, maybe subsequently in the course of this conversation, I'll share my experience, which is totally different from these two, but still another way. But before we go to that third aspect or different aspect, let me now go to the panelists now. So now we have participants who have registered for this and who are attending. Of course, the question they will be asking in their mind now, which of course is one reason why they are here. I want to study in Canada. I want to get funding for my study in Canada. How do I start? What will you tell them? What should, what, what is the starting point? So do we start with, uh, let's start with you, Kunle. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, where should you start from? I think, I think you started already. The fact that you are, you are listening to us now, you registered for this and you are listening to us, uh, means that you started. Because I think the starting point is getting the right information. Uh, unfortunately, I'll just, if, if you, throughout my undergraduate studies, I didn't even know, I mean, there's no way I can be thinking about studying abroad. There's no, I can't even, I can't even finance, I can't even finance studying in my own country, not to talk of studying abroad. So, and it's because I did not have the information. I did not know anything. Like I didn't know that I can study without, there are people who even study here with undergraduate with full scholarship, they, they, they exist, but 
So I think where to start from is getting the right information, which I think uh, what you are doing now is 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 part of it. So um, so and then whatever we are going to give, whatever we are able to give you today is like an abridged version of the information that you really need. So like a summary of what you really need. So after today, you need to go back and try to because it's not enough to just listen and to just listen to this. So you need to go back and start executing the main points that we mentioned. So first, you need to sit down and say, OK, what do I want to do? Which area do I want to work in? Do you want to continue with your area of studies, uh, like your undergraduate studies? Or do you want to try something different? And um, so in your country, there might be rigidity as to moving from one uh, study area to another. But here in Canada, there's possibility that you can move, like there's more, fluid, uh, there's, more, there's more flexibility of moving from one place to the other. So for example, I studied, I studied physics and electronics in my undergraduate. There was nothing biological related, I've, I've, uh, nothing. But now I do more of biology than anything else, than math or physics. So that's, 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 uh, that, that's possible. Uh, and Chinoye, for example, I think she did chemistry, something chemistry, but now she's in neuroscience, doing a PhD in neuroscience. So that's also possible. So you need to check, you need to check the area where you want to work in. That's the first thing. And then you need to start looking for universities so these are these are things that you can do on searches on the website on the on the internet uh, the common one is using google to search like you have a question you search and say okay uh, which schools offer this uh, this field of study that i want to go in so then you need to so after you see the schools you need to like shortlist them you need to shortlist the schools you might want to focus on 10 schools. You might want to focus on five schools. Uh, my advice is the more, the better. But sometimes, yeah, depending on the time that you have. So the more, the better, because it's a, the game is, is the game of probability. The more you push out there, your chances of hitting your goal. So, uh, so search for the schools. Then after searching for the schools, after, after searching for the schools, you need to start looking at specific program, your specific program. So program meaning courses. Uh, so you search for your courses. And then when you go to the, to the course website, then you, you then search for professors that are working in your specific field. So at this point, I think I need to mention to you, and I think I briefly mentioned it, uh, mentioned it the other time. If you want to come to Canada, to study. Your education, one thing that you should know is that your education will have to be funded. So there are many ways you can fund your education. The easiest way is that you have the money in your pocket. And I think it's the easiest way based on, in fact, it's the easiest way based on the fact that, yeah, you can control your money. And then you will probably, you will most likely, with as a good student, you most likely get the admission because here we want, we also want your money because our economy has to, has to grow. So, uh, so that's the best way. But for most people, vast majority of people, you don't have the money in pocket. So the other way you can fund your education is to get scholarship. So you need to search for scholarship. But that's not what I want to talk about today because the scholarship, searching for scholarship, that means you need to look for a body that offers scholarship for students to go and study. So an example that is very popular, and I think is the most, uh, I mean, it's, it's one of the most prestigious uh, scholarship you can get, is the MasterCard scholarship. So MasterCard will fund everything, your traveling, your school fees, your feeding, everything. So that's a scholarship. So you go to a scholarship body and say, okay, please fund my education. This is why you should fund it. So you can do that. So, uh, so try to also look for scholarship bodies that can offer you funding. People get it. So, but 
there's other way that you can fund you can fund your studies, which is that many universities in Canada, if not most, uh, we fund you if you are interested in a research program. So if you are interested in doing research, they will fund you. And uh, I understand that um, this might not be for all programs. So that is why you have to go to the website and check for the information, what you can get from each department. Don't apply to a program or a university that will not, that they don't state that they will fund you. If you are looking for funding, there's no point applying there. If they don't state on their website that, oh, if they admit you, and this is so, this is the funding. If, if you don't see that, you don't need to apply. So each department, if you go there, in addition to searching the professors, there will always be a tab, funding. Funding, which is the next thing. You need to look at funding. You see professors, you look at funding. What is the funding information? So if there's money there, yeah, there's something to shoot for there. If there's no money, you don't need to waste your time since you are looking for funding. So, um, so that's one. So research program, if you want to do research, especially in the STEM field, those of you that are doing sciences and other, other, related, um, other related programs, most programs will provide you the funding for you to come and study here. So which is the route I took? Like I'm into research, so my studies is being funded. So, and I will advise you, uh, especially if you are, especially if you are like, if you think that you are good, which I think you are, because most times, especially where I come from, um, you might, they might, I mean, you might get the projection that you are not a good student, but uh, it's because of the kind of society that we come from. So uh, just know that you are good. Is because uh, when you get into the right environment, you will see that you'll be able to do it. So don't limit yourself. Don't say, "Oh, I, I don't think I will be able to do research." Don't 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 say that. No one, there's no one that knows how to do research from bed. Okay, so it's something that you learn. And when you have the right environment, the right supervisor, you will you will be you'll be able to you'll be able to do it. So I will encourage you since. We need funding, like you need funding. Research is something that can give you funding. Uh, I think you should be interested in it. So, uh, so you need to search, uh, you need to be interested in research. And then the next thing you need to start doing is you need to start uh, trying to put down what we call statement of purpose. This is a, this is a write up that's, it's not something that you write overnight, or it's not something that you take, I mean, depending on, I'm just sharing my experience now as to what you need to put in to write this document. It's not something that you read right over a week. So you need to, you need to sit down and then try. So the statement of purpose, that's a statement to say, out of many, many students from, from wherever they are coming from, this is a case that you should take me. This is a this is a this is my case that you should select me from all of these people. So it's not something that you are going to rush. So you need to present your case. This is what you've done in the past. And it's possible that there might be some people attending today that you are still in school. Maybe you are in your third year or you are in your fourth year. Please, any research opportunity that you have, take it seriously. Because I know most programs they will ask you to do maybe six months or one year research in your undergraduate. Take those very seriously because this is one thing that you can mention in your, in your statement of purpose that, oh, you've had experience with research before. Here, that is what professors want to hear. Someone that has previous research experience. And if possible, when you work with your professor in your undergraduate, I mean, tell them that ah, you also like to have publication. Once you have one publication, Getting into a research program becomes a lot easier because you have that, that experience. So, uh, so you need to write your statement of purpose. So, and it's something I can also send you my statement of purpose for my master's and my PhD if you are interested. 
So, and this is just a guide. It's not, this is not a document that you should plagiarize. This is an original document from you. So you need to write it. And then, uh, so because you will need it, you will need it for your application. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's basically what you need to do. Um, that's basically what you need to do. And so you then apply for your, you then apply for your, uh, for the program. So uh, I think I should also add, so when you apply for your program, generally they will want to charge you like $100 or more, $100 or more. So I will say that as much as possible, don't constrain yourself. Studying in Canada is a very great investment. So anyhow, anyhow, you are going to get the money to apply. Just go and find how to get it. So you put in the application and then the professor that you've uh, emailed previously, uh, you can send them like, you can check up, uh, check up on them to say, oh, now I've applied, no matter what they said to you previously, whether they said they have no funding or uh, they have no funding or they, they, uh, they don't know yet the number of students they want to take, or they are not in the process of admitting whatever, no matter what, after you submit your application, send them an email to say, oh, you eventually submitted your application, blah, blah, blah. And then that you are still interested anytime they, they want to take a student. So sometimes this can come across as to uh, someone who is, who is interested in doing something and, and um, they, might, they might look into your application. So, yeah, that's what I can say from my, my for now. So if there's anything more to that we need to talk about, I can I can talk more. Okay, um, uh, Adekule, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, basically, from what you said now, there has to be research, search for universities, search for professors that are doing work in the area of your interest. Okay. Contact those professors, send them a very brief and concise email about who you are, what you are doing, what you intend to do, and the fact that you intend to, you know, pursue graduate studies in their area. And from what uh, 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 Mr. Aino says, also, you have to be very familiar with their research. And I would like to emphasize on that point from personal experience, especially if you are a professor in Canada. Professors in Canada apply for research grants. When you apply for research grant, for example, SSHRC grant, which is one of the biggest uh, research granting body in Canada, as a professor, one of the key condition, one of the condition key or fundamental to your success or your grant application success is an undertaking to train graduate students. If you file a grant application as a professor without statement to that effect, no matter how good that grant is, they will refuse it. So this is how vital training graduate student is. So any professor getting money from SSHRC for a research must at least hire a student because that is part of it. And when they get this money, for example, I'm working on artificial intelligence. If a student writes me an express interest on my research and that they want to work on that area, they have background in that area. Already, this is more like a, I mean, uh, how do you say it? A demand meeting supply. This is what I'm looking for. And here is somebody who is willing to supply me with that. And I already have the money, which I'm obligated to use for that purpose. So I have to hire that student. But when they become maybe more than one student, then I need just one. Then I will not have to make a decision as to who to hire. So the fact is that, Professors do have that grant money to hire students, but you have to make a case as to why you should be the one for them to hire. And one way to do that is by letting them know that, okay, my research is in your area. Because even if I have the money to hire a student, and I'm working on artificial intelligence, and uh, you're coming with a research proposal to work on locomotive intelligence, <laughs> how do, I mean, how does that harmonize with what I'm doing? So even though I have the money to hire the student, I can't hire you because you will not be, you'll be a burden to me rather than an asset. So the point is, read about the professors you are contacting, 
make sure you are familiar with their work and as well as find out the harmony between the connection between you and what they are doing, then contact them. So that is very important. And when you are contacting them, make sure you really know what they are doing. Make sure you read about them. Don't present a false scenario. Let me give you a very um, important example. I once got an email from a uh, prospective graduate student, you know, telling me how much they admire my work. You know, in fact, what the student told me that um, they've read one of my work and they're really impressed with that work. But you know what? That work the student was talking about was a research on my, I mean, my university profile that I have proposed to work on. I have not even started work on that research yet. And yet this person is telling me that they've read that, that work and they're impressed with it. That was kind of a tone of, I mean, I, don't, I have not published research, so how did you read it? So be sincere, you know, when you are kind of trying to make your case, don't go and present a false scenario, which of course will turn the person off and will not, the person will not view you as being sincere, you know. So thank you very much, uh, Kunle, for um, those points. Now let's go to you, Chinonye. So in addition to, you know, contacting the professors, I did some other research within the university and we'll still come back to the venia research, uh, venia, um, a scholarship after this, but I did some other research within the university students who also uh, look into in the course of, you know, searching for school or searching for grants. Okay. All right, so um, Kunle has said a lot as to, you know, what you have to do and the first steps to take and then you know he's really talked about that and like he's, he's really gone um quite into you know deep into it so i wouldn't really touch on those anymore so apart, apart from your student um or rather your research supervisor's grants which i mentioned that i had for my master's <coughs> excuse me there are um some other funding opportunities available that you can, you know, look into as well. And really when you do this, it um, gives the impression on your supervisor that you really know what you're doing. Okay, you're a self-starter and you're driven, you're motivated, okay? So, and it's very important, I really encourage you, even, even when you're, because I mean, you can bank on your supervisor's research grants, right? Something could happen along the line. Or you cannot even, you know, start out and then hoping that, okay, yeah, um, your supervisor's research grant, like that's like the sort of the only lifeline that you have. So grad studies or grad programs, universities in general would recommend that you look into internal and external funding, and mostly external funding. External funding reason being that um, they would usually have a higher value in terms of, you know, the amount that you could get. So you could get an external funding for like, you know, 15, 20, 25, like depending on, on, on which. So, so you should check the internal funding. So internal ones, the ones offered within the university. You have to check the university's website and then also the program's website because there might be some funding that you're eligible for. Um, as an international student. I know, for instance, um, U of T, University of Toronto, they have a lot of those. Also like, you know, various universities in Canada, they have internal um, funding that you could get. Um, and which of course, if you're depending on the, the application requirements, you may have to work with a potential supervisor. So let's say you've identified someone that you are interested in working with, but let's say the person doesn't even have um, funding, you could work with the person to apply for those internal um, scholarships, right? And then the other one is the external one. Like I said, the external ones are higher valued and um, also like they're very competitive, you know, being um, higher value scholarships, very competitive, like available to anybody anywhere in Canada and outside of Canada. So you can imagine the level of competition they um they have so you um look into those external funding for instance if you're coming for phd 
one of them, the major one which I talked about is the Vani Scholarship. And like I said, the sweet thing about this is that it's open to international students. This is 50,000 per year for three years and you can apply for it, okay? So look at um, you know, the requirements, um, what is required for the, for, to apply for the scholarship and then you plan ahead. You could plan with your potential supervisor because for Vani, you have to be nominated by the university, by the institution, right? And then I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you could also apply on your own, but it, I believe it would be stronger. Like if you have, if, you, if you've identified the, um, the university and then also identify the potential supervisor, you could work with them to develop, you know, the research proposal and the rest of the application. And then you can apply for those funding before you can be given the admission, right? So the thing is, um, you could apply, let's say for instance, um, Vanier usually opens up, I believe in May, June, every year. So let's say you're planning for grad studies for PhD next year, 2022, September. You could apply for, you could start your application, you know, preparing everything, gathering your documents. And at this time, you, you must have identified a supervisor, someone who is willing to work with you to secure the funding and then work with them, develop the application and then apply, okay? Based on your university's, um, um, their timeline and also their guidelines. So you apply for the scholarship, the results usually come out the following year in March, between March and April, end of March to April. So now, once you have your um, divine scholarship, in fact, you don't even have to wait until you have the result or like, you know, until you're awarded the scholarship to apply for admissions. You could apply for admissions for the next year, September, right? But just know that the admission would be contingent on you getting the award. So in your admission um, application, you be you mentioned that you've applied for this scholarship, you've worked with this person, this is a potential supervisor, you've worked with them, and then you would be um, you're hoping to get the funding, right? So once you have the funding, checking out, you're gonna get the the admissions, especially if it's a STEM related. Um, you know, subject or program that you're looking at because you need to have funding before you could, you know, venture into those. So um, to, to wrap it up, like apart from getting your, being funded through your supervisor's grant, you could apply for internal funding. There are so many of them depending on the university. You just have to check to see what's available to you as an international student. And then there are the external funding which you can apply for. And just know that you don't even have to have had, um, I mean, it's very good to have identified a supervisor before doing all of these, because you're, you're sort of bringing the person on and letting the person know, okay, this is your plan. And then they can help you to shape the proposal, right? Based on their research program, because it has to be related to what they are doing. It has to be like, you know, the techniques or whatever, the methodology of your research has to be um, well aligned um, with whatever they are doing, right? So identify those scholarships that are available to you as an international student, then identify how you can start applying for them, find somebody to work with you towards getting the scholarship. And if you have the scholarship, like you're definitely going to have the admission. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Chinonye, thank you so much. So let's um, let's talk more about this um, Venus scholar scholarship, which of course we are very successful in in winning. Uh, can you tell us? I mean, Venus scholarship or Venus award is like the is the most pre prestigious award for international students. Uh, not just prestigious in terms of academic prestige, but in terms of also monetary uh, monetary prestige. I mean, uh -huh. $50,000 a year is no joke. What do you think was really instrumental to your success in being able to uh, get that award or win that award? Okay. In one word, planning. Good. So <clears throat> I believe so much in planning. Um, I mean, sometimes you may plan 
everything, but then you don't eventually get the desired success. But planning puts you so much ahead of a lot of things. And, you know, it puts you in that vantage position where you can take on various perspectives and really understand what you're getting into. So planning. Now, Venice scholarship requires a lot of information to be provided, okay? And these information are not just something that you, you know, pick up any day. So um, if you visit the Vanier's um, website as Prof was showing, um, you see the, Prof, can you, can you open up that, that um, sure. uh, sorry, the, the page again, the screen? So you're judged based on three major, um, okay, yeah. So you can see, and so at, at a glance, in that section, you could see the second bullet point considers three equally weighted selection criteria, academic excellence, research potential, and leadership, okay? There is more to this. So when you go to more details, then you see a lot of information. Now, um, like I said, Vanity Scholarship is, is um, it's a time consuming application and the value 50,000 per year, it's no joke. And this thing does a lot for your CV, for your, you know, um, scholarly contributions. And of course, like, you know, how you look, right? Like you, you appear as that person, like, you know, you're very serious and you know what you're doing, you're competent, you're a competent scholar. So it does a lot for you. And even when you get, when if you're, if you're successful in getting the Vanity Scholarship, it opens doors for other scholarships that if you didn't get the Vanity, you would not even be considered for them, okay? So when you're planning for this award, like I came, I came to Canada 2015 in, um, for my master's. And when I came in here, to be honest with you, there are the scholarship opportunities for mass for international students here, they are not much. There are not many of them compared to home students. Okay. And when I was in my master's, I had very few, very few scholarships, very few. And maybe like the value of one would probably be like let's say 2000 3000 Those are good, but not like, you know, they don't have that critical mass to sort of you know, push you throughout the program, like something like Vanier. So I knew that I wanted to do a PhD at some point. I didn't know when exactly, but I knew that I wanted to work when I was done, when I was done with um, my master's and then I knew I wanted to do a PhD. And I told myself that I was never gonna do that PhD without funding. And when I talk about funding, not like supervisor funding, so I suppose some funding might probably be like 20K, 20, 21, you know, 19, five, depending on the school, depending on the department. So I knew that I wanted serious funding, like serious money for this, okay? And I did my research. Of course, I had a lot of people, a lot of friends, mentors in my um, network. I was able to gather the information that Vani is like number one. So, once I got that information, it was like that day, Vanier is the purpose, is the goal. And then what I did was I found out all of the information that's required for Vanier. So as we saw your research potential, there are some markers. Like if you go into details, um, one of the markers of research potential is if you've had publications academic conferences, you know, attendance, and all of those things that show that, you know, you're very much invested in this, like you, you, you could um, lead a, a competent research program and a successful one, right? So then I knew that publications, you know, um, I've always had this philosophy that if people, if, if something, if I'm required to produce two, I want to produce double of that and even more because that would always boost your chances in whatever you're doing, right? So not just doing the bare minimum. So I knew that for publications that I wanted so much more than the regular person. So I, you know, gathered my information, a regular person may probably have like two, three publications or so. 
but I knew that I, you know, to get very much ahead in the game, I want more. So I started from my master's to plan for publications, engaging in, you know, a lot of research collaborations, not just within in my lab, but outside of the lab. And thankfully I had a supportive supervisor too, right? Someone who knew, um, he, he, he knew my aspirations. And so he helped me um, in that direction. So, so I, I tried very much to nail that part. And then the other one, of course, academic conferences attended those ones. Then um, academic excellence, it's the another you know, class of, of um, criteria. So your GPA, I made sure that I was on point for that one. I made sure that I was well above the minimum. And then the leadership potential, okay? So the leadership potential has a lot of things under, um, under that section, something like, you know, you know your leadership prospects, um, not, just, um, not just during your grad program, but also outside of, the, of, the, of, of your school, right? So there are a lot of things, you know, just like here, there are a lot of indicators, maybe personal achievements, for instance, you've had maybe NGOs, or the major one for me that I, that I targeted was volunteerism. Okay, did a lot of volunteerism, did a lot of like, you know, things like, um, let's say for instance, I'm speaking to you guys, I'm motivating you guys, I'm giving you that, um, my tips, my, you know, the insights into applying for funding for grad studies in Canada, you know, all of these engagements, so they all count. So I got into, and then again, that's so much like it was, was a natural for me because I love to help people. I love to get in, you know, into the society, see what's to be done and then do, you know, try to do as much as I could. So that was so much, you know, very easy for me to coordinate at the time. So I, so the point here is that I, I was planning. I tried to make sure that I nailed every criterion, okay, whatever that's required okay, this is what I'm going to do. I had, a, I had a plan, man, I had a plan, okay? I had not just, not just talk, talk plan, laid out, written down, these are the things I'm going to do, okay? Now, like I said, planning gets you very much ahead, um, but then you may not be successful in the end, but then you'd be very happy and satisfied that you did, you planned. So while I was doing that, um, I identified, you know, like, of course, you know, which where will I want to um, to pursue my grad studies, my PhD studies, and also um, you have to provide leadership reference letters. Who would be able to write me this letter? Um, now I think it's yeah, two, still two two leadership references. So identify people who would be able to write me those letters, and then of course not like I told them from 2015, but closer to the time, maybe like a year to the time. I'm already hinting hey, I would like you to write me this letter when the time comes and everything, right? So also giving the people that are involved, maybe the potential supervisor and all everyone that would write you letters, letting them know that um, you have your eyes on this and when the time comes, they'll be able to write you the letter, right? Very good letters. So um, like I said, everything I've been talking about is just about planning planning for it, okay? Now, when you're done planning, you've done, you know, your due diligence, put everything together, you're like, yay, I've got, I've, like, I've got everything under my belt. Now, the other one is you really have to, um, I was going to say time, but I mean, when you plan, you're already giving yourself ample time to get everything together. The other one now is getting people to review your application. It's very important. I'm telling you, it's very important. You know, sometimes like grad studies, grad studies is not just about um, book smart, like that intelligent A. No, it's it's not just, it's not, it's not. In fact, in my opinion, it's not even that, okay? There are so many qualities that are, you know, um, at play in grad studies. So you really want to have somebody, once you have, you know, written everything, because you also have to write um, a leadership statement, you know, which is sort of a reflection of your, of your leadership and um, potentials, a reflection of the things that you have done or what is driving you um, towards these grad studies and then also you know, your projections for the future. So after writing all of these things, you need to have someone to review them. 
because sometimes you might just be in that your bubble and think you're doing everything right. But then from another person's perspective, and especially someone who is successful in the Vanny scholarship application, like someone who was successful, I had one, one person who was successful and you know review the application and then point out certain things to you, right? So um, the like I said, the, the overall, the key word here is just planning. And now you may think, okay, well, you don't have, let's say you're applying, you want to apply for Vani in, in the next round, which is like I said, between April and May. And I feel like, okay, well, I, you don't have that luxury of time that I had from 215 planning everything. You can still have everything under your belt. You all like, you, ju you just determine, you, sorry, you just need the determination, okay? And resolve that you would give this thing your best shot. So, and I've, I've had people like, as of um, last year, people who applied for last um, for the last years, I had someone who just, you know, got to Nebao Vanier and then, you know, I mentored him and then he applied for Vanier. And first of all, like I said, you have to be nominated by your university and that nomination is a, is a great deal, right? Because if you're not nominated, then your, your application is not going forward to the federal level. So, and he was nominated. So, it's, um, but for him at that time too, I told him, okay, now that you know that you need publications, you need to start working on publications. And by the time he was applying, maybe like two months later, thankfully he had something already. Um, he already um, sent out one publication and thankfully in the field, it was super fast. It was published and then he had another one already, um, you know, under review. So let's say you're planning for May or, you know, planning for this next round then this is like, I feel, actually feel like you have enough time now. You have enough time to start, okay? Gather all of the information that you need. Identify your refer your referees. It's very important because you really need to find someone that would be able to write you a compelling um, letter, something that, you know, highlights so much, so much goodness, right, about you. And of course, in all honesty, and sometimes it can be, it can be hard Sometimes, sometimes you feel like, oh, well, you have those people in your network, but then it's not just having somebody, maybe like a past mentor, but having someone who is able to, you know, um, distill all of those things that they know about you, like in your, in your working relationship with them, and then put that down in like, you know, make and um, create a story, something that will be so, so convincing, right? So sometimes it can be hard to find that person, so that's why you really have to give yourself time now, identify that person in your, those persons in your network that will write you the letter. And then if you haven't um, contacted any potential supervisor, this is the time to do that as well. Let them know that you're planning for Vani scholarship and especially if they don't even have funding, let them know you're planning for Vani scholarship. This is okay because you have to develop your research proposal with them, right? So this is the time to start putting all of those things together and then start, you know, reflecting, brainstorming on, on who you are really. And it's, yeah, like it's, like you really have to pour out yourself on the application, okay? Think about, um, for instance, the leadership statement that you have to write, that one too, like it requires, it requires time. It requires time to think about yourself, think about, you know, what, um, what exactly are you doing and you know, why are you getting into this? Think about all of those experiences or skills that, you've, um, that you had or, you've, or you have that could help you in your, in your courses for, for PhD studies. So it's a lot of things you know, to think about, but you do have time now to start thinking about those things. And then especially if you, I mean, if you apply, if you're looking to apply for grad studies next year and you're here trying to get, a, get um, you know, a, um, the information in advance, perfect. So this is also the time to start putting all of those things together. If you don't have publications, start gathering publications, you know, find ways to collaborate, just find ways to, um, to publish papers. That's, that's, that's all I can say, planning. Thank you, um, Chinoni, thank you so much. That's a, that's a great deal of detail. Now, let me be very, I mean, let me be a very honest, Chinyo uh, has tried, really tried her best to give as much information as she can give, but um, uh, Venia scholarship itself, that one, I mean, you, the information she's giving here is more like a summary. 
uh, full detail will require much, much more time than we even have for this webinar. But I really appreciate the fact that, you know, you've really gone into detail, at least provided the basic information anybody uh, needs that can spark the interest. And like you said, time planning is very important. So it's not something you, oh, I want to apply next day. Then one month to the, uh, when the application starts, then you start preparing. No, you prepare ahead of time, especially in terms of, you know, research papers, publications, and other things like that. So it's not a one month project. It's a one year or more project. But now at least uh, those listening here have at least basic information that can stir your interest, curiosity on the Venus scholarship. And then, you know, you walk towards that and plan towards it. Now, so far we've, uh, you know, talked about funding, 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 internal, from your research professors, venue, and others. But let me look at, um, let me look at another aspect of um, this issue. Uh, because in this webinar, I mean, the essence of this webinar is to provide you with as much relevant information as possible. And at the same time, also to provide you with as much realistic information as possible. Because what we have just discussed so far is one side of the coin. Okay. And what do I mean by this? Uh, now, Canada makes about $22 billion annually from international students. Canada as a country is not Father Christmas or Santa Claus that gives funding to every student that qualifies or foreign student that qualifies to apply because the university themselves they need that money that international tuition students, international students are bringing in. So if 100 students are applying to a particular university in a year, if they are admitting 80 out of that 100, believe me, probably less than 10 will be entitled to funding. So the essence of this project, I mean, this webinar is to help you, I mean, get information that will make your chances higher. But that does not mean that once you have taken all this thing we've discussed into uh, consideration, worked hard on them, then tomorrow you are definitely or certainly getting an admission with scholarship funding. No. It is our hope that you get it. So getting funding for graduate education is the gold standard. But the reality is that a lot of other people will be admitted without funding. So let's now talk about that aspect. And that is where I want to kind of bring in my own personal experience, because unlike um, Chinonye and uh, Kunle, I know who we are privileged to have funding before coming in. In my own case, I got zero dollar in funding. Because what actually happened when I applied to uh, my university here, um, that was University of Ottawa. Um, one of the question, application question was, if you are up for the admission without funding, will you be able to fund your education by yourself? My answer was no. So when I got my admission later, I was told in the admission letter that the decision has not been made on funding. So my idea was, well, since I have told them that I won't accept the offer, I won't be able to fund the education myself. So I'll probably be getting some funding. So, I mean, I started preparing, applying for visa, arrived Canada, hoping that at least a favorable decision will be made for funding. But unfortunately, when I arrived now, I went to the graduate office and to ask if a decision had been made on funding. They told me, unfortunately, we do not have any funding for you. And by then it was too late to go back. So um, I got zero funding. funding. So I have to, you know, fund my master's education myself, which I must be sincere to you. It was not an easy endeavor. I mean, I worked hard. When I say I worked hard, uh, I don't know what other better phrase to use for that. But at the same time, I mean, I was very conscious of what I wanted. You know, uh, it was a difficult experience, but I, was, I stayed focused because I started applying for external funding, hope, hope, hoping that I would get one. I never got one in my first semester. I never got one in my second semester. So uh, that's fall and, and winter semester. So the spring and summer semester is not mandatory. So rather than proceeding, what I did was to take the spring and summer semester off. I used that four months to work 
to save money for my final semester, which is my third semester. In my third semester, which when I came back, I was still applying for funding. Now, as things will turn out, in that third semester, I applied for one particular, there was one particular funding I was seriously focused on. I applied, that was the International Development Research Center Internship Award. In my third semester, I eventually got that award. And guess how much that award was? That award was $40,000 and $10,000 uh, research uh, travel grant to travel outside, anywhere outside Canada to conduct field research for my proposed research. So that's $50,000 in my final semester. And of course, the internship commenced at the conclusion of my, uh, my study. So, that's an uh, internship um, award. I got it. I, I it was actually I actually won it second time. So that was twice. When I was admitted for my PhD, I was also admitted with zero funding. In fact, when I was admitted, re recalling my difficult experience at my master's level, I thought, no, this would be stupid for me to accept this admission. But my supervisor, who was very instrumental you know, in getting me to undertake a PhD, she told me, don't worry, um, take the admission, apply for external funding once again, just as you did. You know, I reluctantly listened to him and I did. Now, let me just cut this story short. Between the end of my master's studies and the conclusion of my PhD, I had over $250,000 research grant or re and research award. Mind you, when I came in, I came in with zero funding. By the time I was completing my PhD, I've already accumulated over $250,000 in research grant. So what I'm trying to say is this, you know, it's good to, I mean, to try to follow that gold standard of getting the funding. If you don't get it, if you can in any way fund your education, one thing I tell people is education in Canada is an investment and it's an investment that has a guaranteed return on your investment. Because once you complete your studies, you are automatically entitled to three years work permit. With that three years work permit, if you work for one year earning the average income, Believe me, within that one year, you'll be able to recoup whatever you have invested in your master's program. Doctoral program is a different ball game because it's much, uh, I mean, uh, the duration is much longer. But what I keep telling people, if the plan is to come in for a, a, a doctoral program and you don't have funding, be smart. Forget about doctoral program. Go in and do a master's program. When you need the master's program, you have your three years work permit you are already in the system. All these venous scholarship and others we've talked about, they are much easier, well, they are not easy, but they are relatively easier if you are in the system already, rather than being outside Canada and applying for venue. I'm not saying you won't be able to get it, but if you have had some education within here, maybe a master's program that you're going for a PhD, you have the reference coming in internally, you already have experience internally that will prepare you for it. So we have seen the various sides of this coin, you know, the easy, the difficult. If you don't get into the easy part, don't run away from the difficult part. People like us have gone through that difficult part and we can come and tell you that, yes, it was difficult, but the experience was rewarding and it was profitable at the end of the day. So uh, this is where we're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna stop here. We see we have uh, a lot of, uh, question on the chat box. Um, Mariam, I don't know if you um, have any of those questions that you want to bring to our attention or to the attention of the panel. Uh, Mariam, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay, sorry. So, Uh, 
Um, so are we moving on to the question and answer segment? Uh, yes, please. If you have uh, any, okay. you may probably want to ask. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, so we're just going to quickly move on to the question and answer segment because in the interest of time, um, there are quite a number of questions here, but I'll just I'll just start with the first one up here. So this question is from Raphael and his question is how long should the introductory email be and, and I think he's making reference to Aino's um, conversation about um, emails to um, prospective supervisors. Okay, I know do you want to take that? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can okay. hear you. So, uh, introductory email about about three paragraphs like two to three sentences each so uh like the first paragraph is just oh you are greeting you are greeting the person and then you're saying you're saying that uh you are you've you read about this thing about them or you read the paper which actually you've read. Don't go and say you read a paper that you've not read. So, or something, or you went through their profile, you are, oh, it looks interesting. And it doesn't have to be great, or it's, all you are trying to do is just, you want to leave an impression so that if you, when you apply for your application and they saw your application, it will be like, ah, I've seen this name before, or this person has contacted me before, something like that. That's all you are trying to do. So it doesn't have to be perfect. If you see what I sent when I was trying to get a, a, a master's program, you see that there's nothing spectacular about it. In fact, when I look at it now, it looks, I'm just ashamed. Did I really send this kind of email? <laughs> because I know better now. So all you need to do is, so like I said, two to three sentences each, three paragraph. The first paragraph, like, oh, uh, you are, it's good to meet them and then, uh, like electronically and they, oh, you read this thing about them, it's very interesting. Oh, actually this is the area that you are interested in and you are trying to, you are already planning to study for graduate study next year. And you are, I mean, you're wondering or you are, you are looking forward to them, uh, maybe being your uh, supervisor. And then the third email, you tell them, oh, this is your previous experience, which connects to what they are doing or which can be linked to what they are doing. And then probably you have to attach something that, that shows that, oh, you are capable, like your transcript or your results. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Kuli. Uh, another question, Mary? Yes. So the next question, I think this next question is also for uh, Kumli. Um, is mailing the prof professors the only way to secure admission? If it is not, is it the most effective? Uh, no. So emailing the supervisor is not the only is not the only way to secure admission. So like I told you, the only way to secure admission, the singular way to secure admission is by applying. That's the only way to secure admission. In fact, if you email a supervisor and he tells you, yes, I'm going to take you, I think I can disappoint you uh, three months down the line. You can just be substituted because you can find someone greater than you like, someone with more impressive credentials. So a supervisor telling you that, oh, they are going to take you, it's not even a guarantee. So emailing them, like I, like I said, is just something to, something to, I mean, create an impression so that, oh, at least someone, I saw some this person, I saw this person before, or I saw something about this person before. That's all. So the only way you are guaranteed admission or the only way that can guarantee you admission is by putting in the, the application. You need to submit your application. Okay, thank you. So the next uh, question is from um, Ayomikwo. And the question is, what would you advise between a direct PhD from BSc and taking a master's first? Uh, I will almost every, uh, every time tell you that you should do a master's first uh, for, for so many reasons uh, uh, that we cannot get into now. But if I must just mention one reason, 
One reason is that uh, PhD is not it's not uh, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So this is not something that you want to gamble with. You need to be sure that this is what you want to do. And masters is a very good way to is a very good way to uh, to test the waters. So plus you have since you are coming in from outside, you have a better chance of getting in. Yeah, and if I may also add to that, because of the you know the difference between the educational system in Canada and you know in Africa. I think I will highly recommend doing the master's program before going to the PhD. It kind of serves as a bridge to help you bridge the two different academic or educational system. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is from um, Irene. Um, so her question is, um, so we don't have to get a positive response from the professors before applying. I think that question has been answered. Okay. So my question is, do you have to get a positive response before applying? Uh, no, absolutely no. Uh, whether you get yes or you get no or you get no response, uh, it makes no difference. Like in practice, it makes no difference. Okay. Uh, and also, I mean, if, um, I mean, even if you don't get a positive response from one particular professor, when you apply, your application may be sent, will usually be shared among professors in that faculty. So another professor may see your work and even like it and then develop interest in you as opposed to the one you've contacted before. Yeah, please, can I add, can I add uh, something? Because this is actually what happened to me. So maybe it will be more, uh, you will be more convinced. So I studied physics, bachelor's. When I wanted to do masters, it was, I mean, that's what I liked. I wanted to study a very specific aspect of physics, is electronic properties of matter. But all my applications, all the professors, with the, all, the, all the messages, email that I sent, no one wanted to take me. I got an email from a professor that I did not email. The guy was working in something called biophysics, something I've never heard of. <laughs> so he told me about it the first time I spoke with him. He said, he sent me an email, the most, the most important email in my entire life. He sent me an email. There's a professor beside me uh, that you said you wanted to work with. Uh, he, has no, he has no funding now. He cannot take his student now. But you have a very impressive application. Uh, can we discuss, when can we discuss about what I do uh, uh, so, that if, uh, so that I will see if you are interested? You know, that's, and then I got the email. I was like, uh, when can we discuss? What do you mean when can we, we can discuss right away, like immediately. <laughs> so, and then we start discussing and then it turns out that most of the things that he even required from a student, I didn't have, uh, I can leave them to you. He asked me, do you know how to do this? I said, no, do you know how to do it? Do you have a friend? No. And the only thing he said is that when you come here, you will learn. Because all he was interested in is someone that, like you have the mental capacity to do something. It, it does not matter whether you even have experience before, if you have the ability to learn. So, and that was how I got into biophysics, which I've been doing for like five years now. And that's something that I didn't plan for myself, actually. Thank you very much, Kule. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question very quickly. And this question is for Chinoye. Um, so this question is from Blessing. And our question is, um, so Chinoye, you said you, you worked for two years before you started your PhD. What would be your advice to international students wanting to pursue a PhD in Canada? Do you think that they should start immediately after their master's? Or should they wait and maybe work for a while or get PR? It's a loaded question. I will, the, the question is for Chinari. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, Blessing, for that question. Um, yes, I did say that I worked for two years before I started my PhD, um, but that wasn't particularly because I, you know, because it was just the right thing to do. It was because like I had my, my plans 
which was like, I already came into Canada and I saw that the land is, you know, brimming with a lot of opportunities for, you know, immigration. So I wanted to first get my permanent residency before I could get into the PhD. So it's more like securing myself in the country. And then also um, some, some of the scholarships that are available for PhD students are only for home students. So students, so Canadian citizens or permanent residents. So I wanted to be sure that I am eligible for any scholarship, okay, that I could. So I don't want the international student status to sort of be against me, especially when I'm already in the country. So it's not like it's the right thing to do to, to you know, get some work experience. Of course, if you have some work experience before getting into a PhD, that could, it's something that you could relate to your PhD program, right? It's something that you could also mention while you're applying for, for the PhD. But then again, um, you wanna be careful as well that you know, if you're getting a work experience, it's the time between, um, let's say your bachelor's or your master's, so the time between that and your PhD is not a very long time. So I just did a two year work experience before getting in, into the PhD, right? But the other one, getting the PR, like I said, this is in no way um, like the correct way to go. It all depends on what you want. And the, as um, someone, someone who is um, outside of Canada and who is looking to move to Canada, you, you have those two paths. You, have, you can go through um, education. You can go through the permanent residence. Like that one is a completely different scheme, you know? You could come in as a student or you could come in as, as a permanent resident of Canada. So it all depends on, on your um, current situation. If you're done with your, okay, you're done with your bachelor's and then um, with your master's, if you can get a PhD, why not? Apply uh, and find potential supervisors, apply for admissions and then come to Canada. When you come here, you still, as long as you're here and you know, you're, you're doing the right things, you'll be able to get your PR. If PR is, is more like something that, you know, you're really leaning towards. But if you're really, if you really, really want the PR, then I would say, yeah, work and get your PR before coming to Canada. Like then when you come into Canada with your PR status, like I said, for PhD, you'll be able to apply for more scholarships, right? Than, than you would if you were an international student. So this is not particular, this is more like a personal decision. Um, if I may add to uh, what Chinonye has just said, maybe I'll be more assertive than Chinonye. Okay. Um, yes, I, I mean, I worked for two years after my master's before starting my PhD. Well, not two years, maybe a year and a half. But fortunately, I was doing research. It was basically research, work, which actually helped my PhD because I remember my PhD thesis topic was developed in the course of my work before my, P, my I, so before I started my PhD. But one important aspect I would have, like to highlight is the immigration aspect. I'm probably saying this maybe because of my immigration law background. If you come in as an international student, if you finish your master's program and you found a fully funded PhD program, fine, go ahead and start immediately. If not, I would strongly suggest that you take time off. You have your three years work permit after your master's. Take time off, work, get your permanent residence before starting the PhD. During that period of work, research about scholarship opportunities available for PhD students. If you get your PR, that opens up a wide range of scholarship that you can apply to. Currently, Venia is like the only SSHRC funded scholarship international students can apply to for PhD. If you have a PR, there are many others. There is the Trudeau uh, uh, Foundation Scholarship and many others. So like um, Kunle Aino said, PhD is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's not how fast you finish it, but you know, how well you did in the course of in the course. So I think um, if you are an international student, uh, seriously consider the PR aspects. Get it, then proceed. Even if you get the PR and you don't get a funding, one thing it does is it automatically slashed your tuition from that of an international student to permanent resident domestic fee. And that could be a huge financial difference between the two. 
So does it make sense to get a PR before starting a PhD after your master's? Absolutely, it does. Yeah. And then you can also do this while you are in Nigeria. Like if you're, if you're planning to come to Canada um, for grad studies and then if that's not panning out, then you can actually pursue PR alongside. And for some persons that I know, they actually were more successful getting their permanent residency than getting supervisors, you know, who would fund their research. So once you have the PR and then once you're here, like you're already in the system, it's going to be easier for you to, to navigate and then find um, a PhD. If that's still your goal. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Uh, next Thank question. You, Yes, so um, I'm going to move on to the next question. And this question is from Prosper. If you don't get a reply from a professor, can you go ahead and apply? Um, I, I think this question has been answered. Yeah. Um, the Sorry, next question can I add something to it? I was going to add something to it at the time. So this, yeah. Also, yeah, so this also depends on the university and the program. I know that some programs you must have identified the supervisor must you must have identified someone who would um, um supervise your research before you apply so you have to check to see what the requirements are for the program and for the university okay thank you very much um the next question is also for from prosper this question is directed to chinonye how do i win a vania scholarship i read sometime that you need to be recommended by canadian school what profile does a Vanya scholar have? I think this question has been answered too, but you know, yeah, you want to... yeah I think I've like I've um, I guess this question came in, you know, way before we talked about Vanya. So, but yeah, Prosper, um, I believe you've you know gained some insight into um, the Vanya scholarship based on what I said. And again, you can go to the website. Okay, the information they are all there. And if you need further clarifications, just um, feel free to you know send um, send an email. I can share my contact, my email, my email address, or you could also contact Prof, and then um, I would give further information. But yeah, like how to win Vanier Scholarship, every the, all the information is it's on the website. Okay, Thank you. and um, if I may also add to that. Um, uh, Chinonye is on LinkedIn, so please you can connect with her on LinkedIn and uh, you know follow up with uh, other questions on Venia scholarship that you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Blessing. Will the rec recordings be available to us? Um, yes, the recordings will be available, um, Professor Gideon. Yes, the recording will be available on our YouTube page. So. Um, please, you can search our YouTube page, uh, probably between now and uh, before Monday morning, uh, the recording should be available on the YouTube page. So if you check our YouTube page or if you follow us on Twitter, I will actually announce once it's up uploaded, we'll announce this on our Twitter page. But um, if you also uh, follow our, um, subscribe to our YouTube page, you'll get an automatic notification, I mean, notification once it's uploaded. Thank you. Um, the next question is from um, Ahmed, and it says, please, some of us weren't able to join on time due to internet connectivity. Please, will the recordings be available to us? Yes, it will be available to you. The next question is from Prosper If I, if I want to start PhD in Canada in fall 2020, when exactly should I start emailing professors leading up to application? Wow. Um, is that from Ahmed? No, that's from Prosper. Uh, Pro Prosper, you should have started emailing them long time before now, because I believe most um, application for fall 2020 for international students, uh, I think the closing date is really like early February. So uh, you should have started emailing long time before now. But um, I mean, uh, you may probably have some two weeks gaps before the close of application process. So if you haven't started that, I think you should start immediately. Um, the next question is also from Prosper. Um, do I need to write GRE or TOEFL for PhD studies in Canada? 
um, I don't know about maybe the science people, Chinoye and uh, Arina. For law, you don't need GRE or TOEFL. I don't know if you guys need it in science, in sciences. So, uh, so concerning the um, English language uh, requirements, so I think if you are from a from an English speaking country in Africa. For example, Ghana, Nigeria. Uh, for most programs in Canada, you don't need a TOEFL or GRE. There are a few exceptions. So that is why it's important that any program you want to apply to, you need to go and see the requirements. So most times they will tell you that GRE or TOEFL is um, it's not, it's not required, but they can say they advise you to take it, something like that. If they say something like that, you can still apply to the program without. So all you need to do most time is just the way you just the way you apply for your transcripts from your university. Tell them that you want to get a document from them. Most universities have it that will say that your undergraduate studies was in English. So once you get that document, yeah, put it with your application, and you wouldn't need you wouldn't need a TOEFL uh, result. Thank you very much, Fule. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question from Max Amanu. Is it possible to get admitted into a research master's program and get professor's funding without writing a research proposal? Well, research master's program, as the name implied, is research master's program. It's not course based program. So, uh, well, I'm speaking from law. Um, graduate study perspective. If you're going in for a research master's program, you have to conduct and prepare a research paper. Um, Kunle and uh, Chinonya, I don't know if that applies to sciences too. Uh, so uh, I can tell for like the STEM, especially for most Canadian universities that I'm aware of, you, you don't need a research proposal. So what we call a research proposal is, a research proposal is, like, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say it. Like, you are trying to write like a project, write about a project that you are going to do and how you are going to do it and all of that. Most times you don't need, you don't need that. But you need something that we call statement of purpose. So statement of purpose is not, is not really a research proposal. So this is where you are going to put this is where you are going to put a, uh, a lot of information, including something that relates with the kind of research you want to do, but in a kind of abridged version. And then it will contain other things like your experience, uh, your publication, and then your, research, your research interest. That's where you are going to mention the professor you want to work with, and then things like that. So it's a statement of purpose. So try to research about that too. I've written two that were successful in the past, for masters and PhD, I, I can I can send them to you for reference. Um, if I may add, again, check with your academic units. Um, like generally, they don't require a research proposal at the time of um, admission, but also check with them because just very few departments would. Uh, okay, can I also say something? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think especially for those statement of purpose where you don't have word limits. You know, some statement of purpose, they will tell you you have this word, uh, word limit. If you have a statement of purpose where there's no word limit, and you put in like a really good uh, like research proposal, I think you will have an edge. Like you are able to write an actual research proposal that makes sense, that is in the line of the professor's work. I think it's going to give you an edge. Like really. Okay, so let's move on. We have like nine, eight minutes uh, to go. Uh, can we go to the next question? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, permit me if I got that pronunciation wrong. Um, so it seems like getting the Venier scholarship will be easier outside Nigeria. All these things are not easy to attain from my understanding and from where I'm from. If I am wrong, how does one get to attend academic programs, do proper collaborative research that could be published in revered journals? 
Okay, uh, let me step in here. Maybe well, I will take the first part of the question in terms of uh, you know the Venian scholarship being more difficult from easier from outside Nigeria. Maybe I'll probably say it's easier from inside Canada because if you are in UK, you are not in, you are in diff, the same boat with the person who is in Nigeria, and Venian scholarship is for PhD studies. So probably the easy way then is to come into Canada as a master's student, finish your master's student, get some opportunity to write research papers, do collaborative work with uh, maybe during the course of your master's program, preparatory to your PhD and of course the Venia um, scholarship. Thank you very much. Um, so the next Can question. I add? Can oh. I add to that? Mm. Yeah, sorry. So um, let's say um, the Venia scholarship, you have like two, three chances to apply for it. So let's say you uh, finished your master's, like you've had your, your master's in Nigeria or whatever um, that you're, you know, you have your degree from. So, and then you get a supervisor who has funding for you for PhD, and then you come into Canada for PhD without venue, right? So once you come in, then work on your, your publications and all of those, and then apply for venue the following year. And if you apply for Vanier the following year, if you didn't get it, you can apply for, um, for it the following year as well. So I think you have about two or three chances. You have to be within your first two years of your program before you can apply. So you don't necessarily need to have Vanier coming in from Nigeria or from any other country. Thank you, Chinaya. Um, so the next question is from Epiphany Osi. And um, the question is, it seems it is easier for those in the sciences than others. I am interested in getting a master's in law. Is it the same method to get funding, supervisors? So. Um, for, okay, uh, for master's in law, well, the basic, the same principle applies here, contacting the supervisors. And like um, uh, I know said, there are more opportunities for funding if you are undertaking a research-based master's program than as opposed to course-based master's program. So for law, you normally have research-based and course-based. Most research, I mean, most course-based master's program in law don't come with much uh, funding. Maybe probably you get some student tuition discount. So if you're really looking for funding, then you have to think about a research-based master's program. And it's still the same process, you know, contacting the supervisors. It's important to contact the supervisors and have a supervisor ahead of time, but it's not mandatory. Even if you don't have a supervisor, your research proposal before the uh, admission committee can speak for you. But it's much better if you have a research uh, a supervisor who has agreed to research, I mean, uh, supervise your research and who has some fun for you. Thank you, Prof. Um, so the next question is from Chidi. Ameniki. And the question is, do Canadian schools accept Certificate of English Proficiency or IELTS for Nigerian students? Um, I thought we have answered that question before. English language testing exams are not usually required for students from Nigeria because Nigeria, it's uh, English language. I mean, Nigeria is considered the primary language of, or language of instruction in Nigerian universities is English. So most Nigerian students in most cases, generally they are waived. But if you have one from IELTS, which is, I believe is the academic, it's acceptable. Whether it is mandatory will depend on the particular institution you're applying to, but most institutions don't require it for Nigerians coming in for graduate studies. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna move on quickly to the next question. And that question is from Ayuade Okay. What is the minimum required grade for PhD admission in Canada? Uh, there's no, <laughs> there's no minimum. Uh, there's no, so uh, getting admission into a PhD program is not, it's not a single measure. It's not your, it's not your, uh, it's not your GPA any single measure. So it's a, it's a, I mean, many, many things that they look at. And I've seen people who don't have up to three out of five, out of five GPA, I've seen people who don't have up to three get a PhD admission, even with scholarship. 
So if you don't have a good GPA, for example, and you have a strong statement of purpose, you have publication, you have other things. So you can make up for wherever you have deficiencies. So there's no, there's nothing like minimum uh, requirement. So the minimum will be based on who wants to accept you. So um, yeah, and and research papers too, research publications also matters. Yeah. Thank you. So the next question is from Prospifying again, and his question is: Do you need to do West evaluation of all your educational transcripts to apply for PhD in Canada? No, you don't. You just need to send your transcripts to the institution. If you have a West, well, that's fine. But the if you send your transcript directly to the institutions, um, that should suffice. Okay. I'm not. I mean, I'm not aware of any institution that require that you must send your transcript through ways. Most institutions I'm aware of want you to send your educational transcript directly to them. The next question is from Epiphany um, Ossi. Um, what about course-based masters? And I think she's making reference to our initial question as to how easy it is to get funding if you're interested in getting a master's in law. And I think professor has answered that question. So I will move on to the final question here. And this final question is from Maureen. Um, please, can you drop the links for us to connect with you on your social media platforms? Uh, so if you, uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Twitter, we are on um, Facebook and we are on LinkedIn and um, our social media, we use Afri Scholars One for both Facebook, social media, and you can also search us on LinkedIn. Um, maybe I, I can drop the. I, I think I think you can send them an email or something. Okay, so uh, at the end of this uh, at the end of this webinar, we will normally do send an email to all participants. Uh, I mean, when we upload the video will send an email to all participants with the link to the video so in that email you're going to see all our social media and both twitter uh instagram linkedin and um, youtube or oh, except they're asking for mine or and chino is uh, social media okay so um i think it, the we have that we do have that on twitter too the linkedin have um I displayed the LinkedIn, your LinkedIn, uh, um, your LinkedIn profiles a couple of times, but we'll still send those information. Maybe in the email, we'll include those information so that they can follow up with you too. And then maybe subsequent questions they have, uh, you'll be able to respond to them directly. So, uh, Marim, do we have any other questions? Uh, well, there's just this one last question again. I just came in now, and it's will the record recordings of this session be shared? And I think you'd mentioned that it would be on YouTube. Yes, it will be shared on YouTube. And um, all participants who register for this will get an email uh, probably before Monday uh, with the link uh, to the uh, social media and uh, the YouTube link for the recording. So it's three o'clock in Ottawa. And um, I want to use this opportunity to thank our two panelists, Chinonye and uh, Mr. Adekunle Aina. Thank you very much for volunteering your time and your knowledge to share this wonderful information with the participants. And for the participants joining us from around the world, we also thank you uh, for staying up late night in various parts of the world to attend this uh, session. Uh, this is not the end of uh, our information session. Uh, uh, we're going to be having some information sub sessions subsequently. And the next couple of information sessions, we're going to focus on study visa application, which is the most difficult process of coming into study in Canada. So we have immigration lawyers based in Canada who have been lined up to attend that, uh, those uh, webinars to provide additional information or very useful information on the vis study visa or study permit application process. So please follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we will be posting information about this webinar once we have them prepared and the date fixed. Once again, from Ottawa in Canada, thank you all very much 
for attending the African Scholars Initiative Canada Graduate Study Webinar on graduate funding. Thank you and uh, see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.